Good morning, everybody. And I think I timed that pretty well, too. Thank you all so very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Brian Kradish with the Harris County Public Library. And as always, I'm here on our third Tuesday of the month at 11 o'clock for our Texas A&M AgriLife Master Gardeners Green Thumb Series. It's quite a mouthful there. Um, but we are really, really happy to be partnering with Texas A&M AgriLife and the Harris County Master Gardeners for our monthly Master Gardeners Lecture. Um, this month, we have our Green Thumb Gardening Series Herbs 101. I'm really excited. We had vegetable gardening last month, and now we have herbs, so we're all ready to make our, our really yummy dinners. Um, today's Master Gardener, Jeannie Donahue, will be joining us in just a minute. But before I bring her on screen, I would uh, love for all of you to type in the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from. Um, please make sure to use the chat for all the questions that you have throughout our program. Make sure to like and share our video because it really helps. 
And then we love lots of interaction. So we might ask you some questions. We're going to try to answer some of your questions live on air. If we don't get to your question live during the show, uh, please keep an eye on the post. Our Harris County Master Gardeners go through and they'll answer all of your questions for you even after the program is over. If you're watching us on one of our branch pages or on the Harris County Master Gardeners page, it might not be a bad idea to switch over to the main library page. That's the Harris County Public Library Facebook page. That way all the comments are in the same spot. But I do check all the other spots in case we have comments on a branch or on the Master Gardeners site. Finally, um, all of our videos you can watch replays of. So if you need any of the information that we post in today's lecture, um, you want to just watch the video again, or you want to see what we did last year, uh, you can find all of our videos on our Facebook page, as well as on the Harris County Public Library YouTube page. We have them all archived there, and you can actually watch it live on YouTube as well. So I see some questions are coming in. We have Cypress. We have Clear Lake watching. That is wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. I think we need to get started. I know we've got a lot of herbs to go over. So I'm going to bring on today's presenter, Jeannie Donahue. And there we are, Jeannie. Good morning. How are Hello. you? I'm great. Excellent. So I know we've got a lot to go over. I saw the, 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 the slideshow. It looks great. I think we jump right on in. When you're ready for some questions, just ask me to come back and I'll come back online. But for now, take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, this is a, a cram course in, in Herbs 101, pretty much. There's no way we can cover all the fabulous herbs in the world in one hour. So what I'm going to do is touch on a few things that we can grow in Harris County and stuff that I've had luck with and stuff that excites me. My job also is to excite you about wanting to learn to, about using herbs. Go ahead. We're going to run through the first few slides fairly quickly just to show you some pictures and I'll kind of talk as we go. So go ahead, Brian. So this is what I'm going to talk about. The herbs we grow in Houston and in, in this subtropical area. Um, we're going to do a little overview of the growing, the herb uses, how to harvest them properly and get the most out of your plants. That's pretty important. And using herbs in the kitchen a tiny bit. Again, this is not a cooking class, but I hope that it'll inspire you to want to go make something. And we'll do a little bit on the preservation for the future your, for the future use of your herbs. Go ahead. These are the ones I'm going to cover today. And most of these can be grown now with exception of a few. I'll let you kind of read down that list a little bit. So we're the, you know, I'm going to talk about them pretty much in the order that you see here. And I'm going to also add in a few little tips and stuff. So please take some little notes, jot down anything that you might have questions about. And hopefully I can answer it. If not, then like he said, the chat box. So hopefully somebody else can help out. So next. So the, the, the growing overview is pretty important in my mind. There's kind of, I want to say three types of herbs. Uh, morphology, I guess, is another way to put it. You have the herbaceous herbs, which are the juicy, leafy ones, you know, like mint, which is the top picture, and mint and basil, all those that, that if you squish them, they're kind of wet. Um, another one is the grassy type herbs. Lemongrass is the perfect example of that. And to the right, you'll see a picture of woody shrubs and trees, and that kind of represents the uh, the rosemary, the bay trees, anything that's literally a woody type plant. And I'll explain that as we go on next. Next, So you can grow herbs pretty much any way you want to. The main thing is, you know, you can grow them in containers. You can put them in your existing gardens. Um, you can even do a special herb garden like the one at the base, which is called an herb spiral. And that's one of the most fun ways to do it. And it's not that hard once you get it built. Go on. Next one. Good drainage is all you need, really, and you'll get creative. What if you have that little wagon sitting around somewhere? These are not my pictures, but I always thought they were fun because you can literally plant plants in anything that drains. Draining is a pretty big word here. Go ahead. And put your herbs where you can get to them. They call them a kitchen garden for a reason. So they're right outside your back door or your front door, whatever your kitchen is. So you can run out there in your pajamas and whatever you're wearing or not, and go pick them. Next. So annuals and perennials, that's kind of a term that most of you probably already know. Now, if you're a beginner, this is an important thing to learn eventually. 
The annuals are usually started from seed. They ha they grow and they produce their seeds and their flowers all in one year or one growing season. And then they're gone. They're dead. Sorry. The perennials, though, will either last and always be evergreen or they might freeze down to the ground if we get a frost and then come back the next year. Rosemary and sage are good examples of that. But then there's that other term, biennials. That one includes the plants like parsley and the tall green fennel that, that I'll cover in a minute. Um, these plants actually technically are, grow, are will grow for about two years, meaning biennial every other year. They'll go to seed. But here in Houston, parsley tends to be a one-year plant, I'm sorry to say, because it's one of my favorites. But I'll tell you how you get more out of it. So next slide, please. Okay, now this is my favorite way to grow my stuff. This is um, the middle of my backyard with vegetables, herbs, herbs in pots, vegetables in pots, vines in pots, a little bit of everything all put there because that's the best location for the sun. And I've built the garden accordingly for the drainage. Each plant, like the rosemary's on the right, that's a big fluffy little plant, that's actually built up on a mound of gravelly sand, so it will drain very rapidly. But now on the other side of the slide, you'll see just some Swiss chard, which is a, a fabulous, colorful vegetable. It has to have a pretty good amount of water, but it still has to drain a little bit, but not nearly as quickly as the rosemary. So you learn to strategically place your soil mixtures underneath those plants when you plant them. Or just like in the picture, you put little pots here and there and, you know, just kind of decorate it however you like. And there's, of course, my one legged bird. He's my he's my mascot. Next. OK, any questions so far? And mostly about drainage. Drainage is really important. And when I say drainage, you add maybe perlite to your soil mix. You can add gravelly rocks and stuff if you need it to drain more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, it should everything you plant your plants in should have holes in it. If you want to be successful. Um, roots need oxygen, but they also need water. Like, like the rosemary loves to be just bathed in water, but it has to be drained very quickly and dry out again. Um, you, oxygen is important to your roots of your plants, no matter what you're growing. Okay. Well, we, you know, we don't have a lot of questions, but I do have Deborah Wheeler saying that um, they're not having a lot of success in growing sweet basil. I don't know if you're going to go over that later on or if you want to tackle it now. I will touch on that in a minute. Okay. Um, I will say just... The, the main thing we've had issues with this year is the extreme heat and drought. Mm -hmm. And it may not be you at all. It might just be the weather. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, everybody who's watching, please continue to post. Ask us your questions. We've been asking everybody their favorite uh, herbs. So we've got lots oh. of mint and basil and rosemary and uh, lemon balm. My favorite is rosemary to use. Um, so I think let's go ahead and keep going. And then we'll just come back for questions in a little bit. Sure. Perfect. So parsley again is, is the biennial, but I actually plant it three times a year. Um, my favorite is the Italian flat leaf, but there is a room for the curled parsley as well. They both do equally well here in Houston, but they have to have some shade in the summertime. You grow it under a tree in the summertime. How about that? Um, it can be quite large, uh, meaning about 15, 18 inches across if it's healthy. Uh, parsley is one of those plants you want to let it grow to its heart's content until it blooms and then you leave that bloom for the bees and the butterflies and then you'll have more seed to drop naturally but in the meantime you want to grow that you want to eat that parsley too so you harvest it from the edges out and parsley grows in kind of a crown shaped where that means it grows out from the center so when you harvest it you pick the whole branch meaning the whole leaf and all the way down to the base and that keeps the plant tidy and it keeps it just a lot more healthy. But in the meantime, you're starting those seeds in the refrigerator. Get that. You plant your uh, parsley seeds in the, put them in a moist paper towel in the summertime about right now for about three or four days. And then put them in your soil and keep it cool for a few days. And sometimes they will actually sprout. Because if you've noticed, you're not going to be able to find parsley at the nursery right now. And that's because it doesn't like hot weather. Next. And this is why we plant more than one parsley too. I put it in my flower beds. I put it all in my herb garden. I don't even have an herb garden. I have herbs everywhere um, in pots, just like I said, just about everywhere because I want those butterflies to come. Those, the parsley swallowtail and 
Well, all the swallowtails love the parsley family. Next. When I say parsley family, these all have these similar type flower heads on them. And there's that beautiful butterfly and the beautiful caterpillar again. I get a lot of questions on um, why does this caterpillar eat my whole plant? And then what do I do? It's like, well, you should have planted more than one. Um, so dill, and then I'm going to go on to the next slide, Brian, will be fennel. And they're very similar growing conditions. But the main question we get with those three plants is how do I get them started? And again, these like cool weather to sprout. Um, a lot of times it's better to buy the starter plant and then plant some seeds alongside it. And then, you know, you've got two chances, of course. Now, fennel, uh, fennel, the bulbing fennel is the one on the left. And it's also called Finocchio fennel, Florence fennel. It's the one they talk about in cooking classes when they say braise your fennel. That's the one they're talking about. Um, and a lot of times it is easier to get these as starter plants. I know I do. I do start them from seed just because I'm a, a plant grower, but I still want to have my herbs. So I go ahead and buy those usually. And I'll tell you, I've got some good places to buy them too in, at the end of the, sh of the show. Um, the one in the middle is the bronze fennel. That one's more of a, I guess, pretty one. You can still eat it. And it comes out that kind of a purpley brown color. It's really beautiful in a flower bed. Put that purple behind a, a bright orange flower, a bright yellow flower, and it's, it's beautiful. And it makes a big fluffy background. And, and the butterflies and the, the um, caterpillars like to eat that as well. But the fennel on the right is the green fennel. It gets about nine feet tall in a good year. And sometimes it'll freeze down and come right back. But it's not the same one as the one on the far left. So when you buy your plant, hopefully you're buying it at um, perhaps a private nursery, a, a little more high quality nursery that labels their plants correctly. And, and there's that. Plants are sometimes not labeled correctly. So I always buy one or two just in case. Next. Okay, now here's our favorite if you live in Texas and if you love cilantro. Now, I know some people don't. Cilantro actually has an, an oil in it that makes it not palatable for some people. It's true. It, it's their taste. Um, but cilantro grows when it's good and ready. It's a cool season herb. That's one that I always buy a baby plant, but I always plant it by seed. I plant lots and lots of seed all over my yard. I, um, I actually sprinkle the seeds literally by the handfuls in the corners of my yard where the grass has gone dormant for the wintertime. So it still gets a little water, but the grass is not even growing. So why not plant something that is edible and is very attractive to all the beneficial insects? And I'm going to talk about beneficial insects a lot because herbs are really attractive to our pollinators, our bees, uh, little pollinating flies, little bugs that you don't even see, but actually make our plants produce, including all our vegetables as well. Um, so I always get questions about coriander and people say, I cannot get it to grow in the summer at all. It's like, yeah, nobody can. It does not grow here. So thankfully we have H-E-B to go to get our cilantro or the, the Mexican market, anything like that. Um, cilantro and coriander are exactly the same plant. It's called cilantro as a baby plant. In, in the United States, it is. Um, it's called coriander in the foreign countries as well. Um, but coriander in America, I'm going to say it this way. Coriander is how it changes its flavor when it goes to seed. It's a very unique plant in that it grows tall once it goes to seed it bolts after about 80 degrees does that clue you in on the temperatures it bolts after about 80 degrees and then the flavor actually starts changing into the coriander flavor um, the seeds are actually what they call coriander seeds so you can use this whole plant in every stage of its life so again one of my favorites because it's so useful and just a great plant i always look forward to the cool season here in houston we're going to call it a cool season um, because coriander and cilantro do beautifully here. Next slide. Okay. And now I'm going to cover three different kinds of chives here. We've got the onion chives. Those grow best in the spring and the fall. Those are the ones that people think of as regular chives. They have the purple flower. They have a round leaf, the, the, meaning the blade is <clears throat> a hollow round. The green part is hollow and it's round. Um, you can eat, again, the whole flower. You can eat all the flowers. You can eat the blades. You can 
divide it up like little onions. If you don't have anything that tastes like onions and you need to have onion flavor, you can always use some form of chives in place of that onion that you don't want to have to go to the store and buy. Um, next. So the next we have the garlic chives. Those are what are thriving right now in Houston because it is blastly hot. It um, is very adverse. I mean, it's just very tolerant to adverse conditions and it will recede. Now it does recede everywhere. A lot of people complain about that. I think it's a blessing because, you know, the bees are all desperate for something to eat this time of year too. So they eat those nice, they get the nectar from the white flowers. The picture on the right is the seed head. Now, if you don't want those coming up everywhere in your yard or in your flower pot, you need to cut that off as soon as those turn brown and get ready to burst open. Um, those two plants are both, those can be started from seed. Um, I always like to buy starter plants from the nursery and again, plant some seeds as well. But they take quite a while, like almost a year to get really big. So a lot of new herbal herb growers get frustrated because their little chives are so small. When they cut them, they whack them up and then they kill it because it's too small to be cutting it. Um, so in that category, I don't have a slide of it, but I want to also tell you that October is the best time to plant the cloves of our garlic. The garlic that everybody talks about in cooking class, you know, garlic butter, garlic everything our lovely garlic. It It is grown here in Houston, usually in October, and you just buy a really nice healthy clove of garlic, break them, break them apart, and you thumb it in. One of my garden people that I, I like to listen to talks about thumbing in, and it's a great little term because you just put the clove on the end of your thumb and you pop it under the ground all the way to the second knuckle of your thumb, and then you've got garlic. The problem is garlic takes until about may to mature so you do need to, to water it and keep it healthy but i wanted to throw that in because garlic is just so fun to grow you have these little treasures in the, under the soil in the in the springtime next okay here we go mint now mint's done beautifully this year for me uh some years are good some are not if you have different varieties of mint, you need to plant them in big pots like you're seeing in these pictures. These are 20 inch pots or at least 20 inches. And that gives them a chance to go laterally, meaning sideways. So the roots grow all the way out to the edges. But then a trick to know, which I learned from a very wise woman years ago, is to take a very sharp knife and you slice down the edge of your pot all the way down about 10 inches and you just slice it down into the soil. You can then lift out a quarter of that whole plant and it stimulates the mint plant to grow more. And then you have two mint plants at that point. I grow it in the ground in one area at and where I work, especially because we use a lot of mint with uh, I work in a hospital situation to where um, a lot of my patients are in recovery. So I give them things that smell good and things that they can put in their water and mint is the category there. So again, you, you try to harvest it right before it blooms which is usually June and July here. Although this year I've had three harvests, no, four harvests of mint, um, double mint or red stem to apple mint is my favorite. So I've had four harvests of this mint this year. And when I say harvest, I literally whack off the top of the plant all the way down to about eight inches and keep all that, dry it, and it makes fabulous tea. Um, when you dry herbs for tea, drying them lets the cells break open when you do hit them with the water. So that gives you a little bit more flavor. You can certainly use them wet or, you know, before you dry them. Absolutely. Um, the flavor is just a little more intense if you dry it first. Next. Okay. We're going to, we could go all day talking about culinary basils and these are just some small pictures of basil. Question I get all the time is which one is regular basil? Well, regular basil would usually mean the sweet basil, which is in the middle. Genovese is also a type of sweet basil. I cut this picture. I mean, I put this picture up because Genovese basil or, or sweet basil will go to flower. When it does, it changes flavor somewhat, but not too much. It just depends on your palate and how picky you are. But I will tell you, once it turns, see the little star in the middle means it's getting ready to bloom. So if you don't want it to bloom quick, whack it off. Now, Brian, I'm going to show this picture. So zoom in here. So this is, wait, wait, where's my camera? Here we go. 
is sweet basil. You see where the other where the leaves come out. You you cut it right above here. So before this plant blooms, I mean I'm backwards here. Before it blooms, you cut the tops off. And I want to say you cut it. Um, that's good. Um, you, you cut it about the third of the top off. Now, if it's very hot like it has been here this summer, you need to shade that basil. Even though basil loves hot, hot, hot weather and water, um, I, I had to actually shade my basils at, at work and here at home as well. A lot of mine uh, succumbed to the extra 100 degree heat that we had this summer. But the other kind of basils I want to touch on because they're so fabulous and there's so many different kinds. These are ones, the ones that I've pictured here are generally the Aussie green, the lemon basil, the purple ruffles, which again is great in the flower bed, by the way. The Thai basil, all of those are easily acquired here in Houston, generally. Now, if you go to one of these specialty nurseries, like the one in Richmond or in Tomball, there's a couple, of, there's one in the Heights. Those nurseries usually carry more variety. So that would be where you'd find these, but, and also in like these, um, there's herb fairs all along in the fall. Um, our, our local herb society always has an herb fair with fabulous herb plants. So look for the different varieties if you can. I'm going to tell you, though, that basil is a warm season plant. So don't try to carry it past about December without disappointment. I do it every year. And every year about February, I have to throw out this poor little plant that's trying to grow in the wintertime. I just save it so I can enjoy it next summer. But please try all these different varieties if you get a chance. And basil does grow well from seed. Um, if you get it coming up, I had it come up a week in one week just the other day up in my greenhouse at work. Next. Okay, any questions about that so far? Again, we could do a whole day on basil, but we're not going to this time because it's going into the cooler seasons. Yeah, any questions on that? A lot of questions coming through, but there a lot of them are getting answered which has okay. been wonderful. So, you know, really, oh, thank you. Um, I want to ask this one here and I'm looking to see if it's been answered. I don't think it is. Oh, um, yeah. So we have a question about rosemary plants and I know we're kind of going right into that. Um, they, they, they keep killing them. They thought they were overwatering, uh, but now they seem to be dying from, from drought. So what's the best way to water? How often should they be watering rosemary? Well, in this hundred degree heat, maybe oh, even yeah. twice a day. I will tell you that, the, and that's why I've separated the gray leafed herbs because they're mm -hmm. a little bit more finicky to grow. Sometimes depends on our weather. We have finicky weather here in Houston. So that's the catch. Um, with rosemary, you have to have those roots bathed with water, but make sure it drains rapidly. And I'm going to show you a picture in a minute about, about what happens to rosemary when your lawn sprinkler sprinkles it because it's not in the, it should not be in the lawn. Lawn sprinkler waters lawn. The other sprinklers, which should be drip irrigation probably, um, would be rose. It should be watering your rosemaries. But to answer your question, you have to kind of just watch it. Uh, my rosemary died this year, so I have a nice pot of brown rosemary that I wanted to show you for this presentation, but it looks pretty bad, so I'm not bringing it in. <laughs> Um, but read this and I'm not kidding it. They all need light watering with fast drainage, but they dislike humidity. Well, hello, we live in Houston. Yeah. So depending what, de how the weather acts this year, um, I'm going to show you a picture of Sage in a minute. And when I get to the Sage slide, Brian, we'll zoom in on that. Mm -hmm. I actually still have Sage right now, but it usually succumbs to the humidity and extra water at this point. Um, but there's that pea gravel or expanded shale. Um, anything you can put in your, if you're going to grow it in a pot, I, st I tend to grow my herbs like rosemary in the ground because I think they do better. You saw the one in that picture. That one loves it mm -hmm. in the ground. Now I always have a second one in, in a pot somewhere because I do use up. a lot of rosemary. Okay. Well, um, that looks great. You know, I think let, let's have everybody keep asking questions, you know, okay. really the, the master gardeners on Facebook are doing a great job just answering them all. So it, it makes it super easy for us. Um, oh, good. Yeah. So let's keep on going and then, uh, you know, call me back in in a little bit. We'll check on some more questions soon. Okay. Let's right. go. So we're going to talk about rosemary, oregano, sage, and thyme. So next slide, please. All right. So rosemary can be shaped into a topiary. This was my kitchen garden one year when I got super ambitious 
I trimmed it into a heart shape. Now there's a wire holding it. So I did wire it together, um, but it's very cute and it was fun, but it took shearing it every two weeks. And it took a lot of water watching. And it was just one of those years where Rosemary did well. And if you look up under it, I'm going to touch on edible flowers, but I don't have a slide for that this, this time. Um, Always grow your edible flowers and stuff with your herbs because all the herbs and flowers are edible as well. How about that? The upright rosemary is usually the one I prefer to cook with. You can cook with any of them. You see the one on the bottom left. That's the um, prostrate rosemary. Um, it's a little more piney flavored, a little stronger. So if you if that's the only rosemary you can get a hold of to cook your, say, roasted potatoes, use it, but use much less. Always taste your rosemary when you buy it. That's a little tip of the trade. You know, if you taste it and you like it, then it's, it's a good one to cook with. Some of them are pretty strong. And when you do harvest them, this is pretty important. Rosemary has to be trimmed right above where you see the, the stem is turning green. So at the very tip, it's green and goes on down and starts looking a little woody. When you trim it, trim it above where it looks a little woody and just kind of trim around the edge of your plant. Don't just take the top off. Trim it to where your plant looks nice after you cut it. Even if you don't use it all right now, throw it in rosemary, you know, dry it if you want to, or give it to your neighbor, but keep your plants trimmed so they'll be healthy and grow vigorously. Um, next. And you see the bees love it as well. Next slide, please. Now, these are some quick, these are some of the great varieties that I like. Again, it's going to be hard to find them occasionally. So go on to the next slide and y'all can come back to that if you choose to. Now, this is a pretty important slide in my mind because people talk about plants in a general way. If you don't know the botanical name, sometimes you can get into trouble. Now, these are all oregano and oregano flavored herbs. The one on the left, Oregano vulgari, is the true oregano. And it looks like a kind of a big moundy plant that grows all over the place. And this is kind of a close up similar one at the bottom picture. Um, that one's actually crossed with marjoram. That's my favorite. Um, but those are those are oreganos, oregano varieties. Now, to the right is the Mexican oregano. That's the one that usually is in pizza flavoring stuff around here in Texas. When uh, recipes call for Mexican oregano, that's what they're talking about. And it's not an oregano at all. It just has that um, oregano oil flavoring. And it is edible, but the bees go nuts over this bush. So if you can get a hold of it, it's one of my favorites as well. It is hard to grow until you get it started. It makes about a three foot bush, though, once it gets settled in. Now, the Cuban oregano at the bottom is not an oregano at all, but it smells like it when you squash it. You can eat it, but I think it tastes horrible, so I don't choose to. Um, but it's actually a plecthantris, as you see in the parentheses. It's a great ground cover in the summer. My neighbor uses it in his Cuban stew, but I don't care for it. But that's why you need to know the difference in the actual botanical name of your plant. Remember, I talked about morphology a minute ago. Morphology, just understand what you've got. If somebody said, oh, yeah, this is an oregano, make sure it is before you buy it. Next. And that takes practice. Now, this one, I probably should have just taken it out, but it's such a cute little plant. And if you can get the pineapple salvia, it's a lovely little plant. It does take to be, it likes to be sheared. This one's been cut back three or four times to make it nice and bushy. But when it blooms, it makes these beautiful red tubular flowers that the hummingbirds go nuts over. It's a, a lovely, lovely um, leafy herb to use in your fruit teas, your fruit punches, anything like that. It's, it smells lovely to me. It's just a nice, soft pineapple smell. It likes the cooler season, but as long as it gets water and gets shaded in the summer, it will survive here. Next, but it's a salvia, so I, that's why I kind of threw it in with the gray leaves. Now, this is the one that's pretty important because I'm from the South and we use sage in our turkey dressing. So I really want my salvia or my, my salvia officinalis, which is the culinary sage. I want it to live through the summer. It doesn't always do that. Um, you see the three varieties I have listed here. Those are the three that I seem to find the best luck with. Now, Brian, here, here's when we need to zoom in on this one. This one is the Bear Garden. You see how it had, wait a minute, see how it has the, the nice leaves at the top. Those are, those are still doing well. But this is what happens when sage gets too much humidity. See that I'm trying to get it in front of the camera properly. Sorry. 
not very good at this. You see the, the dark blackness? Well, it's crawling up the stem. Um, if you look up closely, you can see that the new little leaves are still green up against the stem right here. But you pick off all those brown ones if you can. But that's what the humidity and the hot rain does to silver leafed plants. And this refers to all the gray leaf plants. See how it's curling over? I don't know if it's going to make it or not, but all I can do is keep trying. And if I see a new one at the store, I'm going to buy it real quick just in case this one croaks. But that's something that we have a lot of trouble with, with all of these gray herbs. Next slide. But the upright sage is still the best one to, to work with. In Houston. Here's a, here, this is the upright sage and it's blooming right before Easter. Now it's a perennial. It lasts all year long. Again, if we don't have too much rain and humidity in the summertime, you do need to keep trimming your plants after it blooms like this, trim it back and shape it up nice and pretty, but keep trimming it. Even if you don't use it, herbs like to be trimmed. It's just, it's a part of growing a plant. You just have to keep pruning them. And, um, stimulating them. Next. Okay. Put, put the slide up, not me, because <laughs> the slide is a little tiny slide. There you go. Um, so thyme, thyme is another one of those plants that's kind of hard to grow sometimes. Other times it grows all year long and it does beautifully. I still have my lemon thyme um, this year and I made chicken salad this morning just because I was so excited to have some lemon thyme and it's delicious. But you, you learn which variety you like. The upright ones generally are the ones people cook with the most. And you, get, you again will find many different varieties of thyme. Some do better in Houston than others. This is not my picture at the top. Um, that's kind of a dream picture. Sometimes they do that in Houston, but not very often. I have my uh, thyme in three different pots usually. One's in the ground, one's in a pot and one's in the front yard somewhere else. Um, plant them on mounds. And also my trick is to plant a log up underneath. I say plant, put a dead log up underneath my plant and that props it up off the ground, but it also allows air circulation up under that thyme plant. And in the meantime, you're giving a home to all those ground beetles and the, the, um, the good insects in your garden, the ones that come out at night and eat all the bad bugs for you. So, but you see the little roots coming out at the bottom um, on that little picture on this, on the bottom slide. Sometimes you can pinch off um, a branch of your thyme plant and have it root. The best way to do it is actually to have a pot next to your plant, let it root into the new pot first, then cut it off. And rosemary does that as well. You know, it's that kind of plant where it, it can be grown from the roots like that, but they kind of go into shock when you cut them off from their mother. Sounds familiar if you have children, right? Next. But see, this is how I like to grow my thymes. Each one of these is a different variety. Um, these pots are actually set in that picture that I showed you earlier of my whole big garden in the middle of my yard. Um, if you have different varieties, this is how you learn to use your herbs. They taste different. They look different. They're pretty. They're pretty in flower arrangements. You can use them all sorts of ways. Next. Okay, any questions about those particular herbs? Okay, we're going to carry on. Okay, yeah, I was going to say, I don't see any questions, just, uh, you know, a few people are, are happy to hear they're not the only ones who've lost herbs. Um, oh, no. Oh, you I think know, that's reassuring to hear for a lot of our viewers. Well, you have to remember that they're small, little, tiny plants. We have very harsh weather here sometimes. Um, you just have to understand that at least you've had a few weeks or months of this lovely little plant, then just go get another one. They're not that expensive. And, and that's my, my advice to everyone. They don't beat yourself up. If it dies, then well, maybe you learned from that and go try it again. Please just don't give up because you'll realize once you grow them a lot, you'll, you really enjoy them. And the more you study them, the more you enjoy it as well. Perfect. Now I'm putting in ginger just because I'm putting a little little tick in your ear to, to grow ginger in the spring. Ginger, you know, again, this is kind of leading into the fall, but ginger is, and, and turmeric as well, um, are, are lovely bushy big plants. And they grow these lovely um, tubers under the ground for you to use. 
You can buy ginger at the grocery store to grow if you like. The problem with our grocery stores here in a civilized world, they cut off the growing tips so it will not sprout in the grocery store. That's what you run into when you, draw, when you buy ginger at the grocery store. I, however, will go to um, an organic market of some sort and, and get a ginger that has the two, the little pointy things on the tips of your ginger fingers. And those are all the little going to be sprouts to grow into your new plant. Um, but I encourage you to look up ginger and turmeric as well and how you can grow it. It's in a subtropical plant, but they take about nine months to grow. Um, so let's go on to the next slide because I just wanted to put that in your head just to remind you that look how cute that is. I mean, the, the fresh ginger that is in the picture on the right has a beautiful flavor. Um, the turmeric, again, you have to learn how to cook with it. You learn how to grow it. It grows lots of those little rhizomes under the soil. When you harvest them, you can harvest just hundreds of them. Again, you got to share it too because there's a lot of them. But it's a great plant. Both of them are great little plants in our subtropical climate. Next. Okay, now these are my favorite. The uh, lemon verbena. And I'm going to put the lemon balm on the same slide because I use these interchangeably sometimes because sometimes I don't have the other one. I usually always have lemon verbena. And that's one that I absolutely will buy three plants of because that is one of my favorite herbs in the world. It's one of the most sought after herbs in the world because it has that beautiful lemon flavor. Um, people make soaps out of it, all kinds of stuff. Um, the thing I want to tell you about these, they both are kind of fuzzy leafed and kind of rough. So if you were to like stick one in your mouth and chew on it, it's going to taste like sandpaper or going to feel like sandpaper. You can actually um, dip it in boiling water if you really want to put it in your mouth. I mean, you can do, do either. It doesn't matter. But they both have beautiful lemon flavors. And I want to tell you that you need to trim these plants pretty regularly, like every two weeks. Um, so you'll have a big harvest. Um, it's just a lovely plant. All of them, both of them are. Uh, you can use them interchangeably in um, baked goods like muffins. You know, lemon, lemon verbena cookies are awesome. Lemon balm. Actually, it's the herb of the month right now. So it, look up all kinds of stuff. When I say herb of the month, um, the Herb Society and Herb, let me see this. Other herb organizations all declare an herb of the month. So it's fun to look that up and see what they're talking about. Because then you'll learn some more about it. Um, it's, it's a very, both of them are, are very medicinal in my mind, mostly because they smell so nice. I walk around with the leaves in my pockets pretty much all the time. I walk around out in the yard and poke it in my pocket because it smells so good. And my patients enjoy it as well. So I, I enjoy giving it to them. Um, next slide. Again, I don't want to go on too much, but here's some lemongrass. Why not plant that in your front yard? I mean, it looks kind of like those ornamental grasses. Not quite as uh, ornamental as, say, the pompous grass or something. Although lemongrass does bloom, but nothing like the big plumes. But you know what? You can eat this one. And that's what I like about it. I always like plants that you can eat and grow for herbal reasons, but you can also just look at it for ornamental purposes. Um, the lemongrass picture at the bottom is from the grocery store. So those lemongrass stems are much larger than what I usually get here in Houston. Um, the Indian lemongrass is what I usually have. Um, I want to show you a little trick too. So this is one I use in my stock. You see how I've got it tied up in a knot? You just, you just wad it up and stick it in your soup. And then you just take out the knot. Don't fuss around with chopping up your herbs and trying to make it harder than it can, than it has to be. But I will tell you a trick with lemongrass. Most of the um, flavor, well, you can eat the whole stalk. I mean, the tea, the, the, um, the whole leaf is edible all the way down. And this is one, this is a grass. Remember, I talked about the morphology. You cut it all the way down at the base. Um, the base are these pictures that you're looking at at the bottom. But then you can take a, a mallet or a hammer or a meat cleaver, whatever you have. And you smack it a few times and you break up the cells that are in that stalk and the flavor will come out much more. Um, this is just one of those herbs. You just have to use it and understand it. Makes great stock, makes great tisanes, teas, whatever. Just lovely beverages of all sorts. Lemongrass is just a fun plant. It freezes down in the wintertime if we get a freeze. 
Um, I encourage you to leave the top that's frozen across, meaning it's going to turn brown on top. Leave it in the yard. It, that top frozen part will insulate the lemongrass if you get another freeze. Then in early spring, when you start seeing a little more green come out of the very base, then you can trim off the ugly stuff. Um, sometimes you have to go through an ugly period to be beautiful. So we all know that how that is. Go ahead. Next slide. Okay, this is another favorite that is very underutilized here. Thankfully, it's coming becoming more popular recently. Um, Mexican mint marigold. Um, it has beautiful yellow flowers that are edible. The green, it's a perennial. It, it does freeze down in, in a cold, cold winter, but then it usually comes back. It can be used as a landscaping plant. The bees love it. People always say that it's a substitute for French tarragon. Um, again, that depends on your palate. I disagree with that. Tarragon has its own flavor, period. However, if you don't have tarragon, guess what? You can substitute Mexican mint marigold. Why not? Just try it. The thing with that, um, it has a pretty strong flavor. You can make some beautiful compound butters with it. And it um, is very flavorful, just a few leaves at a time. Um, Brian, zoom in on this right here. So I made this for one of my patients yesterday. I work at a recovery center for uh, drug and alcohol recovery. And um, a lot of times things just smell lovely to these people. So I give them little nosegays. You see how I've got the Mexican mint marigold here, which is this one right here. And I've got a piece of lemongrass and I tied it around in a little bow. Got that? And then there's a piece of rosemary in it. So all three of these have their own scent. You see, it's just a very small bunch. You see my big old fingers here. But each one is so strongly flavored and just so special. I made this for this young lady who came in and she was in tears yesterday. And I made one exactly like this and said, here, smell this. How does that make you feel? Do you like it or do you not like it? She just calmed down in an instant. So little things like that is, is, are the reasons that I grow herbs. Go ahead. But the, but the Mexican and Marigold grows there where I work and... So I grab what's at hand. I like to grow things that I can use all the time, just at the tip of my fingertips. Next slide. Okay, bay leaves. I have to talk about bay leaves because I'm quite, uh, I'm an avid cook. Um, I'm from the South, New Orleans cooking, all these people. We all use sweet bay laurel. Um, it's one plant that I don't choose to leave the, the, the leaf in my food. I cook it in the food, but then I take it out. Um, you can buy crushed bay leaves or chopped bay leaves, or powdered bay leaves, but you know, I still don't like to ingest it. But again, that's a personal thing. I like to use bay leaves off my tree, which is that picture in the right. That's growing outside the back of my house. Oh, and see, there's my little rosemary at the bottom. So it was really, well, that was two years ago. It was really cute at that point. Um, before that horrific freeze we had, um, the bay leaves, I like to use fresh. I'll, I'll put nine or 10 bay leaves in the bottom of a pot and I cook broccoli on top of it. And that broccoli is infused with a beautiful bay leaf flavor. And butter is optional in that case. I love butter, but you know, sometimes if you're trying to cut calories, using herbs like that are really a special way to use it. So that's one of my favorite things. And bay, of course, is used dried or fresh. It's, it's just a nice plant. Again, a landscaping plant. Use it in your instead of bushes. It is a bush. Why not? It grows in the in the streets of Rome. Why not use it? I mean, it's a, it's a symbol of strength anyway. So why not have that in your yard? OK, next. OK, I need to cover this. Any questions about the herbs I just covered? I'm going to kind of go around to some cleanup with our herbs um, after these slides. Um, this picture here, the one on the top right, you see I've circled this little green creature. Well, he's the size literally of a pencil lead, just the lead part. He's a little tiny green bug. It's called a leafhopper, salvia leafhopper. Hence the reason they get on anything that is considered a salvia. Both your ornamental salvias, the ornamental sages, the culinary sages, the rosemaries. This little creature is kind of a, a real pain. And what they do is rasp the, the leaf surface. They, they take the chlorophyll out of the plant and they leave it spe speckly looking. 
So it doesn't hurt the plant unless they're in big numbers. Then you do need to knock down the, the insect using a, a registered method, which my, my first method is spraying it off with hard jet of water. Then use soap, perhaps like a, a insecticidal soap. And you know, safers is an example of that type of thing. Um, if you have to use a pesticide, and I, dis I discourage that only because you're going to be eating this plant, um, make sure it's labeled. Make sure it is labeled for food consumption. And I'm just going to say that three, I, I don't need to say it three times, but understand that what you're using is what you're going to eat later. So there are registered pesticides and soaps that are specifically for food. So make sure you know what you've got in your fingertips before you use it. How's that for a lecture? Um, on the left is rosemary that has been also damaged by this insect and by spider mites. Um, we had the question about the rosemary dying. Well, the, the picture at the bottom is usually, it looks like that a lot of times because the lawn sprinkler hits it. Then it gets fried in the sun or it stays wet, or the sprinkler comes on in the evening perhaps, and the plant stays too wet for too long. Sometimes it'll do that. You can cut out that ugly part for sometimes and save your plant. Sometimes it just doesn't, you can't save it. I've lost three or four big rosemary plants at my job because their lawn sprinklers are not set properly sometimes, and they drown my, my rosemaries. So now I have to plant my rosemaries in a big raised container with an open bottom. Um, next slide. Okay, these are some other culprits of your, your damage. Uh, the top right picture is um, actually grasshopper damage. Grasshoppers will munch out on your, your nice juicy basil plants. And they'll eat all your baby ones, by the way. So kind of watch that. And they feed at night. So yay, you don't even know they're there. The snails and slugs, of course, we all know that happens when we have lots of rain. That hasn't been a problem this year, has it? Not in Houston area. The picture on the bottom left is a piece of basil, and usually I'd say anybody know what, ha what happened, but that is from mechanical damage, meaning somebody squished it and it turned black. So when you handle basil, you have to be nice to it. You, you chef and odd the leaves, you roll them in a nice little roll and slice them with a nice sharp knife or some scissors, or it turns out like that. The flavor is still good, but it can look like that from cold damage, like if we get a really cold night and your basil is still in your yard. It's going to look like that and not feel very good. Um, so that's what happens when basil gets mechanically damaged. Um, and to the right, too, that's a spot. You see, it's it's um, a spot caused literally by something dripping on the leaves. And it can be a fungus. It can be, which is spread by dripping water, by the way. And, um, you know, spots on your leaves are okay sometimes. But if you see a lot of them at the bottom of your plant, go ahead and pick those bottom leaves off and destroy them. Don't throw them on the ground. You can eat them, but you know, why not, why not eat the pretty ones, right? Next slide. Okay. So I've touched a little bit on the harvesting and of course, ideally the mid morning may be the best after your dew is dried and all that good stuff. Um, but when you learn about each particular herb, it, you, you learn when to trim it, when to cut it, you still have to groom them. Grooming and, and harvesting is a different is different. When I say harvesting, um, for example, if you buy basil already cut from the grocery store, from the farmer's market, those people have grown up basil plants and they've chopped off probably the top third of the plant. But again, they've got about 10 different plants. So if you plan to have a, a lot of this particular herb, basil in particular, if you want to make pesto, you need way more than one plant because when you chop that top of the plant off, you need to have something left. So again, you learn to work with whatever herb you're playing with or, or working with or eating or smelling. You learn that, that morphology a little bit. It kind of teaches you where to cut the plant. Um, again, maintain the shape of your plant. They're, they're cute little plants. Why not keep them cute? Next, next slide. Okay. So you can freeze your, your herbs in oil or butter. That, that's my preferred way. You can freeze it in stock or water. You can dry them. Again, in Houston, we in, in, in a humid climate, a friend, a friend of mine lives in Australia, and they, they grow lots of stuff, and they have to dry their stuff inside too because it's a subtropical area as well. Um, you dry them inside on a screen where they get plenty of air circulation under the air conditioning, and then you put a, a something to catch the leaves if they do fall off. 
um, but keep them clean. You can use the microwave. I've used it for parsley and chives, but again, I prefer to use my herbs either dried from the grocery store or fresh from my yard. So that's my personal preference, obviously. Next, I'm going to show you some pictures. Now, these are pretty good pictures. They're not all my pictures. The one in the middle is mine, though. I use this one a lot. I take my basil, I grind it up, just not completely ground up, but I'm, I pulse it up in my food processor with just a neutral flavored oil, not necessarily olive oil. I use um, a lot. I use, um, if I'm feeling very wealthy, I use a pecan oil or, or something that doesn't have a lot of flavor because all I'm doing is, is preserving that flavor of the oils. It complements the oils in the leaf as you grind them up. And that gives you that flavor of that fresh basil in an oily base. So you can then make, say, the pesto on the left. Now, I will tell you that once you freeze it, it's going to turn a little bit darker color. But the flavor is still there. So, again, if you're desperately wanting some basil in December and you froze some like that, yay, you froze some and you preserved it. I found that, um, again, I like to wait for the next season. So sometimes I look forward to my basils. But I always have to freeze it a little bit. So, but but you're not making the full batch of pesto at this point. Um, because if you, now pesto is, just means a paste. And you can use, you can uh, preserve cilantro this way. You can preserve basil this way, even mint. And a lot of the herbaceous herbs is, is, are the ones that I prefer. Um, but if you make a pesto, the traditional pesto has ground up nuts, ground up Parmesan cheese or some kind of cheese or something, and the oil and all of the above into a paste, which comes out as the finished pesto, like you see in the picture. If you freeze that, it is certainly still edible and it tastes delicious. I will tell you that the texture will change somewhat. If you have a, a finicky palate, as one of my best friends has, um, she doesn't like the mouthfeel of that. It makes it grainy. Flavor still there, though. So again, it's up to you. Now, if you're particularly ambitious, you see the picture of the ice cubes on the right. Those are all herbal flowers that have been frozen in ice cubes. Um, it's a beautiful way to have a presentation. If you're having company or even just your best, my husband, I do it for him sometimes just to make dinner more special. Um, frozen cubes, uh, you see the water broth or oil. There's your ice cube. You have a designated ice cube tray um, because the oil will kind of imperv and will penetrate the plastic and you'll always have the herbal flavor in your ice cubes. So um, anyway, next slide. Okay, this is this is my absolute favorite way to do it. Um, we do cook a lot at my house. Um, and we like to experiment with different herbs. So the best way to do is um, use something neutral. Like the, the picture on the left is actually cream cheese rolled up with some herbs and I put in wax paper. And I, I start with a recipe. If you don't really know how to do this, you know, look to um, your local herb society or people who know what they're doing. Um, again, you've got the Internet. Look it up and, and try a recipe first and learn the flavors that you like. But you use something neutral like a goat cheese or a cream cheese first. Um, the picture on the right is a butter, an unsalted butter. Um, that happens to be Mexican mint marigold butter with a little bit of lemon zest and just some rolled it up and I put it in the freezer. So when my fish comes out of the oven, I just pop those little pieces of butter on there and it's delicious. Um, cheese balls. Again, people my age, which again, I'm dating myself. Cheese balls were the thing. You always brought like cheese balls, but that's because they are delicious. That one happens to be made with chives and you see they decorated it with, with the, the purple onion chives flowers. Put that on that beautiful corn. Yum. Anyway, so that's another way to preserve your flavors. I usually just make one stick of butter or two sticks of butter at a time. Sometimes I will make it go farther by diluting it with a little bit of that neutral oil. Or if I know what I'm going to use it for, again, that will determine what type of oil I'm going to put in there. But that makes the butter go a little farther sometimes. Again, we love butter here too, so that's why I'm a little chubby. Next, next slide. Okay, now this is, uh, again, I do love my herbs. You know, the herb-infused vinegars are fun. Um, I use the white wine vinegar, the red wine vinegar, the champagne vinegar. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a controversy where I, um, because I work with drug and alcohol recovery, you know, 
recovering patients are not allowed to have anything with alcohol in it, you know, um, and that even comes down to vanilla extract, things like that. So, but when it's a vinegar, a vinegar is a vinegar. There's no alcohol left in it. Now, I'm not a chemist, so I hope I sp did not speak incorrectly, but vinegars are a way to preserve your oil, your uh, flavors also. You make instant salad dressing by using a vinegar um, that's already flavored. You're, you're one step ahead and you don't have to chop all that stuff up. Right now, I'm looking across my kitchen at some white wine vinegar that I put some dill leaves in. Um, I warmed my vinegar just, just very slightly, not even hot, just very tepid. Put it in a, a ball jar, which is a canning jar, stuffed as much base, as much dill as would fit in there, and I put it in my pantry for two weeks. And that infused that beautiful vinegar, so now I have that herb dill flavor, and I don't have any more dill in my yard. So I have that vinegar that I preserved. So see here in Houston, dill and the dill pickles are the, are the best example. Dill does not grow at the same time of year as our cucumbers do. So if you want to make dill pickles with homemade fresh dill, you're going to have to preserve that dill somewhat or somehow. So that's the best way to do it. You make your vinegar ahead of time with your dill, remove it. You've got this flavored vinegar. Then you pop your little cucumbers in there or your your cucumbers to make your pickles like that. So there's little tips that you have to learn by living here in Houston. Again, your local organizations are, are some great places to learn even more about herbs. Um, but when you when you make your vinegar, I always put it in for two weeks, then taste it. If it's not quite strong enough and I do have more herbs, I'll add more herbs to it. If it's strong enough, then I take it out and I pour it through a strainer and I stick it in a little salad decanter and it lasts. Oh, gosh, doesn't last at my house, but it it could last about two, two months or so because it's a vinegar as long as it's covered and, and kept properly. Now, the, the next slide is pretty important for people here in Houston. Go ahead. Uh, well, no, that's my vinegar. I meant to, I'm referring to the following slide, but you see how I've done it. Um, oh, two slides away. Sorry, I goofed. Um, this one is how, how you do it. You just stuff it in there and you make small batches. You see the little tiny decanters. That's what I mean by small batches. If you're really um, good and have a great recipe and have lots of herbs and lots of vinegar, um, you know, like some of these people who um, have like herb fairs and stuff, they sell the herbal vinegars and stuff. Um, in, in larger bottles because they've made it big bulk batches of it at home. Just do a small batch and see if you like it and always write on the on the lid what you put in there um, so you'll know how to make it again. Next slide. Same goes with um, infusing sugars, making jellies. Um, you have to bruise your herbs and steep them for a little while to get that lovely flavor. But you always want to remove the, the um, vegetable material, which is the leaves. You always want to remove that. Um, so then you continue with your recipe after that. Syrups are a great way to do it. I, you know, I when I'm really feeling ambitious, I'll make a sugar syrup out of um, the lemon verbena and basil. And it's really delicious. And you put it in lemonade or any or, you know, any kind of teas, anything you like, anything cold right now. Anything cold is delicious, right? Next slide. Now, this is one that, that I really want you to pay attention to. In a hot climate, herbal infused oils can cause problems um, with the chemistry. Botulism is clear. You will never know if botulism is in your bottle or not. So people who are experienced making herbal oils generally will make it at home on their stove. They'll cool it off on the counter, but then they refrigerate it and use it within two weeks. That's just the general rule, rule of thumb. Now, when you look on the Internet, they're going to say, oh, make your little herbal infused vinegars in the sun on the windowsill. I would certainly not recommend that here in Houston. Um, again, please research what you're doing. And the AgriLife does have some good canning um, videos and information. So always look to the people who do the research on how to make these things if you just so desire to make them. Next slide. OK, now this was all dedicated to my girlfriends and boyfriends and my grandson who used to work at Bear Creek. This was our herb garden, one of our par portion of our herb gardens that we grew at Bear Creek before the Harvey flood destroyed it. Um, but you see how large and lush all these herbs are. Everything in that garden is edible in some form. 
we just had the best time. So I just want to say, you know, make it fun, enjoy what you're doing and research it. It's, it's fun. It's always tasty. Again, I love food. There's so much food to eat. There's not enough time in the day. And um, it's pretty easy to use some of the herbs. You just have to try them to continue on. Um, next slide. I think we're pretty much done. So again, grow, create, and experiment with your stuff. Um, the next slide will have some of the resources that I've used. Um, like I said, that your local herb societies, your and there's several units around Houston area. Um, internet, of course, is very important, but you have to always add a couple of weeks of heat to whatever they're talking about for Houston. We're, we're a few weeks ahead of time. Like when you grow seeds, start them two weeks earlier here in Houston than the packet says on the package. Did that make sense? Anyway, um, so there, those are my uh, favorite go-to books and people and stuff like that. Again, the AgriLife has some good stuff going on right now. So please, you know, that's the first one that's up there. Um, the Southern Herb Growing by Madeline Hill. She was one of my most influential people in the world. That book is no longer in print if you get it. Um, it's quite a quite a charm. So I, I would encourage you reading it at least. It's fun. She, she was a, an incredible cook. She and her daughter made that or wrote that book, but it's not digital. So if you see it at the half price bookstore, I would encourage you to pick it up. Um, and Galveston County Master Gardeners, I have a little book that I bought from them many years ago. And it's a very good, very to the point herb book. Herb Society of America, Guide to Growing. Oh, my gosh, it's a huge book. But if you really want to research something, pick one herb, research it keep reading about it, and then you're going to learn it, and then go use it. That's how you do it. Um, and uh, Bill Varney is still in Fredericksburg, so there's an herb garden up there, and he teaches a lot of stuff up there. So anyway, um, that's all I've got, so thank you for tuning in. Um, I hope you got some kind of, of some interest in growing. If you learned one thing, then consider yourself successful. And that's what one of those influential people told me one time. And she was right. You learn something every day if you try hard. We have two questions that I think we should go over before we end, if you have a minute. I do. Go ahead. Excellent. So the first was um, one of our viewers was asking about ginger uh, back a little bit. They're growing ornamental ginger and wanted to know if that is also edible. From what I've read... And what yeah. many of my herbal people in, uh, I am a member of the Herb Society as well. And a lot of my friends there say every ginger is edible. It's just whether you want to eat it or not. It's not <laughs> going to, it's not going to grow that rhizome under the ground quite as big, or it's not going to taste the same. It's just kind of different. Um, a lot of the flowers are edible. Again, that would be where you'd have to research. And I'm not an expert on that myself. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then going back just a little bit as well, we were talking about um, cleaning um, and sterilizing your jars and your wonderful um, pitchers and decanters. Uh, so one question was about whether we should sterilize just before, but I wanted to ask if you had any tips for just cleaning in general with those odd shapes, how do you usually yeah. clean uh, them out? Dishwasher, use the dishwasher and, and uh, have it have, put it on sanitizing cycle. Mm -hmm. um, it gets hot enough and steams enough. Now you can always cook. You can always clean those kind of things with steam, but mm -hmm. that's why I never put the ver the um, leaves actually in those cute decanters. Sometimes okay. you can see them for sale and stuff, but the first thing I do is get some chopsticks and pull that out. <laughs> that's okay. because I don't want it to get icky inside. Yeah. So that, that's your best tip is not to leave the leaves in there and that way you don't have to not as hard to clean. Right. And they do awesome. look pretty and for sale, you know, for sales, like again, like at herb fair, or, you know, mm -hmm. I think the uh, local herb society has an herb fair coming up in November this year. So oh. you have to look that oh. up and you know, that's a place to get great plants mm -hmm. graded by some really unusual people. It's, it's very fun. Um, I'm not sure of the date, but I believe it's in November this year. First weekend, usually. Um, but when you have an odd shaped vessel, just like anything, you have to have a bottle brush. Mm -hmm. You have to use steam to clean it. Or again, always sterilize your jars anytime you're preserving any type of food. Perfect. Okay. Well, I think that's everything for today. You know, it was a wonderful um, presentation. I know everybody really, really enjoyed it. We had lots and lots of comments throughout about oh, what good. everyone else is doing with their herbs, how they like to cook, what they like to grow. 
um, it was it was just fantastic. So thank you, Jeannie, for being here. Thank you, all of our viewers. Next month, September 20th at 11 a.m., the third Tuesday of the month, we our presentation will be on plant propagation. So you can join us for that. And then in October, we have citrus trees coming up. So we've got two really great presentations coming up. Um, again, please like and share the video. If you want to see any of the past videos or you want to go back to this one, this will post in just about five minutes online. And you can view all of our older videos on our Facebook page and YouTube page as well. Uh, thank you again, Jeannie, for joining me today. We had a great yeah. time. We'll see you all for our next video. Thank you. Ciao.